Today, we are eager to connect you with Professor Elliot Britton, a professor in composition and music technology and the director of the U of T Electronic Music Studio. This studio was actually established back in 1959 and was the second electronic music studio to exist in North America. And Professor Britton's work and research continues to explore the intersection of composition with culture, technology, and the natural world. He is a successful recipient of several large Canadian grants which have funded his research and composition efforts uh, in this collaborative way. And given the nature of Professor Britton's work and its inherent audiovisual audio visual qualities, uh, Dr. Britton has pre-recorded a video, which I will share with you now. All right. Thanks for such a good introduction. It's a privilege to be able to create and teach here at the University of Toronto and to be invited to come and share some of what I do with all of you. I'm going to focus on a bunch of different approaches that I've taken to reaching audiences over the last few years. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience going into university as a young composer with a really strange skill set. And hopefully that'll give you some ideas of what to expect if you're interested in being a composer at a university. Or if you're interested in taking the musical skill sets that you already have and then building them out into something more creative more fully developed and flexible and professional so that you can keep growing and learning and developing as a composer. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the unique and interesting challenges that face composers who are living and working today. So we're gonna jump right into it. There are a lot of ways to take a passion for music and to transform that into creation. And for me, it really starts with this idea of combining imagination with the technique and sound worlds of tradition and innovation. Because here at the University of Toronto Faculty of Music, there are so many ways that people who love music and are passionate about music are making music every day, thinking about music, researching music, writing about music, and performing music. But the important thing to remember is that if you're interested in becoming a musician or somebody who creates music, you've got to figure out how to make your own music in your own way. That can be as a performer, as a singer, or somebody who works with technology, which is the way that I came to music. I am somebody who has a dance music and music production and piano, choir, jazz, punk ska background. And... For me, university was where all of those ideas could get mixed with the history, research, creation, community side of music that I didn't even know that I needed to help me get to that next level and to help me be a composer who's out in the world doing interesting projects. So as someone who starts with Baroque music and video game music, it eventually came into this much bigger world of what does it mean to be a composer who's trying to reach audiences in the 21st century? One of my first concrete composer memories is sitting on the floor in my basement playing an old game, Final Fantasy, with my older brother and then just listening to the counterpoint and the harmony. And then it all of a sudden just dawned on me that there's so much in common with this and the music that I really love, which is Bach and Baroque music. And I just remember thinking, okay, this is a good sign because as far as I could tell up until now, all of the music that I really love is by composers who are dead and whoever had made this music must very much be alive because they're still making music and there's new a new game coming out in a couple of years. So that was when I kind of realized that there was this world of music that I needed to figure out as a young person. I needed to keep moving towards this idea of what does music mean in the 21st century? What are the things that I need to learn in order to create and be part of this progression of musical culture that keeps moving forward and can connect with audiences? So what you're listening to here is a piece for four percussionists who are playing two marimbas that are kind of interlocked together. And the music is kind of a commentary about 
video game music. So if you think about classic video games, they had some pretty limited uh, primitive synthesizers in them. So they had to do a lot with the notes and the resources that they had. And if you think about a percussionist who's playing something as big as a marimba, they have to do a lot with the mallets that they have. So there's kind of this intersection of early synthesizers and chiptune video game history and then marimba performance practice. So this piece is kind of breaking apart these two worlds and trying to force them together to create this intersection of classic video gaming and then percussion virtuosic chamber music performance. And I sometimes use this one when I'm having conversations with students about what is the role of video game music when you're trying to learn to be a composer? If you love video game music, does that mean that you have to just write video game music? And the answer is, I think that the best video game music composers are just really the best composers who have figured out how to do interesting things with notes and sounds and pitches and rhythms, no matter what the context. So if you only write the same thing over and over again, you don't grow. And setting yourself up for lifelong growth and learning is the most important thing about going to school as a composer and then surviving and flourishing and having a sustained lifelong love of creating music. Alright, so the next project that I'm going to show you is a little bit weirder, a little bit more conceptual, is called Oxblood Diamine. And this one was just me trying to figure out how can I make a tiny, tiny performance as small as something that could fit on that on a postage stamp be dramatic and huge and exciting and absolutely fill a concert hall. So I'm going to just show you a little bit of that now. So what you're hearing and seeing are different ways of zooming into material. As a composer, I love taking things that you can barely see and blowing them up so that you can really get an idea of what's going on. So what you're looking at, there's a really heavy duty fountain pen with a titanium tip that's being used as a percussion instrument. And then a special, I guess a dermatology microscope that's being used as a way of making a sort of a show out of a really, really small space. So there's bow hairs and the ink's getting absorbed into the page. And I'm picking up all of the sounds that are happening during the performance with really, really close up microphones and then really processing them and shifting it around and turning it into something really large so that it changes the way that people look at things that are small. Because as a composer, I'm always looking at ways to change people's perceptions of things or get them to hear something that they've never heard before. So I want people to think about the small sounds around them, and that's what this piece is all about. The scraping sounds of a pin or the little bits of bow hair as they move across a string, and then what would those sounds be like if they were 10 feet tall, the size of a, of a concert hall. So the next project that I'm going to show you is related to that first one, because as a composer, you're always learning from every single project that you do, and I'm no exception to that. So the first project in this series was called Oxblood Diamine, and it was looking at things that are really small. So then I thought, you know what? I'm going to take that same idea and I'm going to bring it out into the natural world, and then I want to take all of the drama and excitement of all of these tiny little spaces out in the natural world, and in this case in southern Alberta at the McIntyre Ranch, and I want to blow them up and create music where you can hear all of the different parts of all the different scales of time that are unfolding around us when we're outside, out in the natural environment, and then make it into something that feels cohesive and feels like music. So I want people to hear the music that is unfolding at time scales that are outside of our ability to perceive and then crush it all together into something that sounds almost like a choir. So this is Hyperscale Landscape, and it was a commission from new music concerts, and then it's existed in a few different iterations, because, you know, as a composer, you can always remix, rearrange, and rebuild for different audiences and different opportunities. So that's exactly what I did with this one. This is Hyperscale Landscape, first for remote or distance 
chamber ensemble. And then there's a few clips here of the version that was performed at the New Music Festival in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And then there was a version that was performed here at the University of Toronto by the Percussion Ensemble back in 2021. You're probably wondering what some of this stuff is, because I know that at some level, whenever we look at things that are really small, it kind of has this alien, almost computer animated look to it. Um, but beyond that, what I'm doing here is I'm combining the world of machine learning with all of the footage that's coming in through this digital microscope that I took out onto the land. And then I'm splicing that with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the musicians playing their instruments. Cause I kind of want to really take this idea of synthesis and then take it as far as I can go. Cause one of the things that you learn about being a composer is taking an idea and trying to keep pushing that idea and exploring that idea and taking it to its limit and figuring out, is there something new that someone else hasn't done before? And for me doing this piece that takes machine learning and combines it with these digital microscopes to create almost this animated world that's both really small and then blown up to be really, really large is my way of expressing something new. So behind all of this machine learning and careful sample manipulation and really aggressive processing and digital audio workstation magic, the fundamentals of music theory and harmony and all of the stuff that I can absolutely trace back to my first year in university in my undergrad is all there. These harmonic motions, how to control the lines of different instruments, how to create four-part harmonies that resolve and build tension and build up and then release. These are all the kinds of things that you learn as part of an undergrad in composition and performance. Usually harmony is part of any music curriculum. And then what you choose to do with it as a composer and how you choose to build on it, expand it, or maybe simplify it is really the most exciting question. How do you make it connect with an audience using all of these tools and techniques and craftsmanship and musical skills in a way that expresses something unique. So another thing that composers get to do is collaborate. And I've been lucky enough to collaborate in all kinds of different contexts, mostly with performers, but I've collaborated with other composers, animators, artistic directors, and curators. And one of the people that I've had the privilege of collaborating with is Sandra Laurent, who is the executive and artistic director of Red Sky Performance here in Toronto. And the projects that I want to talk about a little bit are Atazokan, which was a large scale project with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra that features dancers and video and a special soloist named Nelson Daguna. And then another dance show called Trace. And what is interesting within the context of this talk is that these two collaborations couldn't be more different in that one of them is really more about collaboration and controlled improvisation and working with people and me producing backtracks that the musicians then develop their parts over top of. So that's Trace. And then Atazokan is a much more strict and structured orchestral piece where the orchestra parts and everything needed to be signed, sealed and delivered uh, months before the project actually started and Nelson came, flew down to Toronto and walked out and started rehearsing. So I'll play a little bit of Atazokan and a little bit of Trace and I'll talk over it.
composers are inherently quite diverse creatures who end up being involved in all kinds of things. So, for example, I work as a curator and I run a festival called the Cluster New Music and Integrated Arts Festival along with Ashley Ow, and I learn just as much from other people's music who are applying to the festival, who want to have their music played, as I do composing my own music. I learn from looking at the way that performers struggle and rehearse. I learn from trying to put together a concert and figuring out kind of what is going to work for my audience and what isn't going to work for my audience. And that type of experience, the experience of being a curator, is a great way of taking your skills as a composer and then using them to benefit your community because you're building up this venue and this opportunity for performance, for your art to exist in the world. But it's also a way to learn more about the sort of the meta world of composition where it's not just about the rules of your own piece, but the piece sort of expands beyond a single work and starts to become this greater cultural artifact. It develops a cultural context where the audience becomes part of it, the performer is part of it, and then the festival itself or the performance venue itself starts to develop its own culture and set of expectations. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much emphasis on student-led composer concerts at the University of Toronto, because developing those skills and relationships is extremely important for future growth as a composer who's going to go out into the world and work for a video game company or as a curator or as an orchestrator or a film composer or a composer who only wants to write chamber music. And I hope that by this point, I've shown you the different ways that engaging with history and tradition and imagination and innovation have benefited me. And I hope that you can find what you need to grow, develop, sustainably and connect with your contemporary audience. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak today.